Let's start. Okay, so welcome back all. And allow me to introduce our first keynote speaker. He is the Europe first certified Scrum trainer and one of the leading experts in extreme programming. <coughs> Man, that you can meet an intersection between psychology, social complexity science, and agility. He is a true believer and practitioner of a lifelong learning, cooking at professional level, orchestra conducting, programming, agile practices, and he does not stop there, currently pursuing PhD in psychology and psycholinguistics. Interestingly, part of his research was founded by an online dating site. <laughs> From the technical part, <laughs> The Q&A session will follow the lecture, so please add your questions at Joseph's channel at Slack, and from there, um, me or Michal will pick them up and provide to him at the end. And with that, wait no more. Joseph, with his talk, Love in the Time of Corona, welcome. The stage is yours. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I, uh, I'm not used to that type of introduction uh, today, so uh, I need a second to recover from that. Uh, you've just told everybody all my secrets. So uh, let me share my screen and get going. By the way, I hate using PowerPoint, but that seems to be a very good way to do things right now. Can you see me? Can you see the screen? Someone say yes? Yes. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> love in the time of Corona. This is actually a new version of a talk I did last year. Uh, so I started to call this the 100 Years of Solitude and Zoom Meetings Remix. Uh, I'm Joseph and who am I and what am I doing here? Well, <clears throat> it says Agile Psychologist. Those are my two sides. On the one side, I've been working with Agile Methods since the beginning, since day two or three back in 1995. On the other side, I am a real psychologist. Uh, I have my a bachelor's and a master's and I'm working on my PhD in that. Uh, so one of the places I worked at, I used to work as CTO at this place, which you might know. And back when I was working there, something happened. A little volcano exploded up in Iceland. Maybe some of you might remember that. Actually, there's another one that just exploded a couple of weeks ago. But back at that time, Ayafiyayo Kult exploded. And within 24 hours, it threw all air transportation or all transportation in Europe back a century. I was stuck <clears throat> at home in the Swiss Alps. I couldn't get to the eBay office in Amsterdam which wasn't too bad. So I started working at home office a long time ago. But I had, for example, I had a team of developers that were stuck at our site in Levyev in the Ukraine. They couldn't get home. I had a friend of mine who was a pilot for Swiss Air. He couldn't get home. He was stranded and he missed his own wedding, right? Well, in the meantime, everything's straight. He's happily married and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. But what I started to realize is that in our life, we have volcanoes. Volcanoes are events that happen that have three characteristics. First, we can't predict them. We don't know when they're going to happen. Secondly, we can't influence them. And thirdly, we have to react to them, <clears throat> right? The classical volcanoes in business, first, they're your customers. You can't predict what your customers are going to want. You can't predict fashion. People who can do that, people who can influence that are very rare. Steve Jobs was someone who was able to influence that. But you have to react to changes in what your customers want and changes in what they need. Otherwise, they run off. They go to the second volcano, which are your competitors. You can't predict what your competitors are going to bring on the market. You can't influence that. Companies that aren't technologically innovative anymore attempt to influence their competition, often by means of patent suits and other legal means. <clears throat> Think about the patent suit from Apple versus Samsung, a billion dollar lawsuit on the shaping and the rounding of corners of mobile phones. Or think about the patent suit Oracle versus Google on the naming of Java APIs. 
These are companies that aren't really innovative anymore that are trying to stifle their competition. The third most important volcano though, is the ones that happen because of external influences that we don't expect and don't have under control. And that's the one, the greatest example is the one that's causing us to meet virtually and not live, Corona. Who would have thought about that a year and a half ago that that would change the way we work, the way we interact, All right? But what happens if a volcano overwhelms our ability to react? No, we psychologists have something to deal with that. That's something we call adjustment disorder. Adjustment disorder is the incapability to react to a rapid change. It's actually the antithesis of agile. When I try, when I'm asked to define agile and what it is, I say agile is a way to react quickly, efficiently, and effectively to volcanoes. Sometimes people can't do it. Sometimes people have organizational arthritis. They're just not able to react and to change fast enough, right? So <clears throat> these volcanoes, they shake the foundations of our being sometimes. They force us to go back and question the basis of our existence and of our interactions. This is one side. The other side, psychology, right? One uh, other reason I'm here is because there's a gap between research and practice. And I'd like to say a quote from a colleague of mine, Nora Dunbar, who said that as long as we real psychologists just keep talking with each other, there will be the slick pseudoscientists who are filling the void with their articles and their talks and their training programs. This is very dangerous. And we need to do a better job of communicating real science to practitioners who can be helped by it. That's the reason I'm here. One of the words that I'm having real problem with, one of the basis of our interactions is psychological safety. Now, as a psychologist, I'm often quite frustrated when non-psychologists throw around buzzwords like psychological safety without understanding them. And often I come back and use this famous quote from Inigo Montoya. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. So what is psychological safety? Many of you have read or heard these quotes already. It's a shared belief that it's held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. It's a climate characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect, which people are comfortable being themselves. <clears throat> right, psychological safety is not comfort. It's not a lack of tension. It's not fun. It's not harmony. It's not holding hands and singing Kumbaya after your retrospective. It's something different. Psychological safety, in the words of my colleague, Arabella, a psychologically safe space is a dance floor where you can be yourself. Think about that, dancing. Think what it's like to be out on a dance floor, how comfortable or how uncomfortable you are. Think about how difficult it is to go, on a, go out on a dance floor if there's no one there. Think about how rapidly the dance floor can be cleared if something goes wrong, if someone acts weird, or if the music and the rest of the space is not safe for you. This is what psychological safety is, okay? <clears throat> Psychologically safe space is a room of trust that can only be built together with others. As this room isn't physical, it's mental. It can be built in a virtual environment. There are just a lot more challenges building it in a virtual environment. Psychological safety is an aspect of culture and culture itself is a derivative property that emerges as a result of the process of social self-organization. As such, a derivative property, it can't be directly influenced. And the difficulty of changing it in a complex, resilient environment, such as an organization, is challenging and difficult. This is the reason why 
many leadership workshops on culture or team events aimed at changing things and working together better aren't directly transferable to the everyday working environment. And they don't result in a lasting change to an organization. A derivative property cannot be changed directly. It changes as a result of something happening. Now, what is that? <clears throat> Psychological safety is not based on affection. Psychological safety is based on trust. Trust, that's the intersection of a person's hopes and fears, Simpson says. Or trust, it's the confidence that you will find what you want from someone else rather than what you're afraid of. Okay. Trust, trust is the currency of our human interactions. Trust is what we deal in. We do not trade in information or in emotions. No, the amount of information we give someone, the amount of emotions we show someone, that depends on the trust we have for each other. Trust is like the interest on your bank account. It takes a very long time to accrue it, but it can be spent and it can be lost very quickly. Once lost though, trust is very difficult or even impossible to regain. Remember, trust can only be given. It can't be taken and it can't be demanded. How do trust and psychological safety interact? Trust is a personal attribute. It's part of your personality. This means it's contextual and it's dispositional. Contextual means it depends on which situation you're in and dispositional, it depends on some of your basic personality traits such as introversion, the amount of fear you have and your negative experiences in the past. On the other hand, psychological safety is an environmental attribute. It's a derivative property that emerges as the amount of trust in a group increases. So how does trust increase? Holmes and Rempel once said, the establishment of trust is a process of uncertainty reduction, right? So what's the problem that we have? The problem that we have is that humans, we're not meant to live alone. We like to interact with each others and then we become attracted to others. But what happens becoming attracted to others, entering into relationships with each other leads to a dependency on the other. This dependency leads to vulnerability and to anxiety. And what we have is an ambivalence. We have a dissonance between the attraction that we have for someone and the fear and the anxiety. And what happens is that this ambivalence leads us to evaluate the other person's behavior in order to reduce uncertainty. So how do we do that? <clears throat> a typical way we can do that is with something that we call a strain test or some of us psychologists call a shit test. A shit test, one of the typical ones is if you ask someone, could you do me a favor? Hey, could you get me a cup of coffee? Ask someone to do something for you, right? And see what they do. If they do, you see that their motivation is changing for some reason. And this reason leads you to believe you can trust them to do this in this situation, okay? One of the big challenges that we have here is that the more rules you have, the more norms you have, your team agreements can potentially stifle building trust. Why does it do that? It does it because if you have these rules or these norms or your agreements about how to interact, you can't gauge when you ask someone to do something, whether the reaction is done out of a transformation of their motivation, or it's just done because the response is expected or it's required according to the rules and the norms and the agreement. 
Okay. So you've all heard the stuff from Google and everywhere that you need psychological safety in order to get teams working well together. Right? I agree with that. The question is, why is it so difficult to establish trust and psychological safety when you're in a virtual environment? One of the reasons is something that we call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance theory, it says that individuals seek to maintain consistency amongst their multiple cognitions, amongst their thoughts, amongst their attitudes, amongst their behaviors, etc. Some inconsistencies in this produce an unpleasant state that motivate individuals to change one or more cognitions in order to restore consistency. Now, how many of you believe in global warming? How many of you believe in air pollution? How, how many of you believe that if we don't do something about this, that we're going to have problems with the world? How many of you drive your car to work? Think about it, that's the cognitive dissonance, right? This is a discomfort, which puts you in the position of either changing your behavior or some way rationalizing your behavior, okay? So this is one of the problems we have is that our world has changed because of Corona. It's changed because all of a sudden we've gone from working face-to-face -to, -face to working virtually. And really, I love some of the memes that have come out of this, All right? Some of you might have seen this. Yeah. Our first virtual meetings, I remember a year ago, it's like, you know, connecting to a spaceship that's going off to Mars or something. Hey, can you hear us? Can we see you? Things like that. Remember what it was like starting off doing the, all these virtual meetings last year? Or things like this. I don't have any donuts. All I have is a glass of water next to me, by the way. But please, if you have something to eat and drink, please enjoy it while you're listening to this talk. So what's happening now? It's best explained by Gian Piero Petrolieri. He says, <clears throat> I finally understand why everyone's so exhausted after video calls. It's the plausible deniability of each other's absence. Right? Our minds are tricked into the idea of being together when our bodies feel and know that we're not. And this is a cognitive dissonance. Right? It's easier being in each other's presence or being in each other's absence than in constantly being reminded that we're not together. Our bodies process so much context, so much information in our encounters that when we meet on video, it's like being a weird kind of blindfolded. We sense too little, but we can't imagine enough. There's no space for imagining, right? And that deprivation, that requires a lot of conscious effort. This conscious effort, this goes on to multiple levels of awareness. From this quote from Maurice Merleau-Ponty. I look at him, he sees that I look at him, I see that he sees that I look at him, and he sees that I see that he sees that I look at him. Right? There are no longer two consciousnesses. There are two mutually enfolding glances. For Merleau-Ponty, this kind of experience, they're part of what he calls an embodied reversibility. I can see and hear and experience you as you can see, hear, and experience me. This doesn't work in a virtual environment. Why not? Eye contact is lacking. Have you ever sat someplace, ostensibly face to face, and talked with someone who is constantly staring at their mobile phone? Okay, even if you work for Motorola in the mobile department, come on. You know, what's it like to talk with somebody who's constantly looking at their phone, right? 
with eye contact, you not only observe the eyes of someone else, you see them attending to you while you're attending to them. That's what's missing, right? Looking awry, looking strange. Even if you're not on camera, right? You're not on, you are on screen and you're probably bigger than life size. If you start picking your nose, everyone's gonna see you do it. You're constantly being reminded of that. And face to face, we're able to monitor our speaking as a result of our vocal projection and the acoustic environment. <clears throat> we do this based on an assumption of acoustic reversibility that others hear the world as we do. Right? When you're talking with somebody, you're aware of raising and lowering your voice and how the other reacts to that. In a virtual environment, you're not. Online, this isn't the case. Your microphones might be muted. The sound is undirected, right? We often use sound if we close our eyes and listen to someone or something. We instinctively turn our heads in the direction of where the sound is coming from. The sound in a virtual environment is not directed in that way. Some more psychological problems is the feeling of being watched, the feeling of being observed. If we don't have this overt eye contact, this embodied reciprocity, you know, people who video conference, they can sometimes feel that they're being scrutinized or observed by the others, right? Although we might pretend to be looking at another person when we FaceTime or Zoom, really we're looking at ourselves, right? Fussing with our hair, we're adjusting our facial expressions, trying to find most flattering angle with which to hold our phones. We have issues like the Mona Lisa effect. <clears throat> Mona Lisa effect, meaning that regardless of where you move, you get the feeling that the picture that you're looking at is following you. What we also lose is pro proxemics. Proxemics is the feeling of what we really used to call social distancing. How close do you let a person get to you? We have four different proxemic zones from a general zone where everyone is to a zone where people we know are to a zone where our friends are to an intimate zone where our close partners are. And this is how close you let a person come to you. Right? In a virtual environment, you have no feeling for the proximity of another person to you. And this makes you feel uncomfortable. Right? You also have an issue of self-focused attention. By constantly being aware of yourself being on camera, by constantly looking at yourself, you're constantly reminded <clears throat> of not only are you looking at yourself, but others are looking at you. And what this does, depending on your personality, depending on your disposition, this will lead to a social anxiety that can start from being uncomfortable, to depending, you know, if you're introverted, to depression, up to the point of paranoid schizophrenia. This can be difficult. I remember many friends of mine who said, oh, I'm an introvert. I've been waiting all my life to be able to work like this. And these are the people that I'm dealing with as therapy patients now, because after a year of doing this, after a year of having no face-to-face -face contact with people, they really start noticing how all these problems are coming up and becoming even worse. It's funny, Jaron Lanier once said that human action Interaction has both verbal and nonverbal elements. And video conferencing seems to be precisely configured to confound the nonverbal ones. One thing that I noticed that I'm really missing here <clears throat> is the feeling of having the space and time to just sit there 
and not say anything. When I'm video conferencing with someone, I get the feeling that, okay, I'm an older man. Many of you may not know this. But I get the feeling of having a call running over a 14 4K modem where I'm looking at every second that I'm online on CompuServe or something, costing me a lot of Swiss francs. We have the feeling we don't have the luxury just to sit there and just not say anything, just to be comforted in the presence of someone else. Right? This is one thing I notice a lot, having worked a lot up in Finland, where the Finns tend to be very quiet and just comfortable with silence, comfortable just being close to each other. Right? So if these or the issues that we have, what can we do about them? I'd like to give you a couple suggestions. <clears throat> As Petrolieri once said, a social media, all that stuff, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter and stuff, that was just practice. This is the real life game. We're not only just learning new tools, we have to relearn how to be with each other and how to interact with each other or what we lose, what we lose since it's an existential game is our self, our identity, our personality, and possibly even our lives. I've spent a lot of time the past year not working in the agile field. I've spent most of my time doing therapy and counseling, especially for medical personnel who've suffered and risk their lives so that others can, uh, can live. I've seen part of the good side of what's come out of this. You know, the, the uh, corona babies, some of them soon to be born. I've also seen the bad side. I've seen the depressions, people. I've seen domestic violence. I've seen all these things. This is what's happening. We have to learn to play this game. This is very important. Right. If you remember this quote, it's been attributed to Darwin. It's not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It's not the strongest that survives. But it's the species that is able to adapt to and to adjust best to the changing environment in which it finds itself. It's the species that is most agile. Mm -hmm. Now, despite the odd ways that communication takes place at a video conference, as a society, we have to get normal, get accustomed to this. This is going to be the new normal. One thing that I think a lot about is with school children. Right now in Switzerland, you know, <clears throat> people being pol politicians being worried that with homeschooling that children are not learning property that they're not going to be qualified to enter the working system and i have to think about that and i have to say no they are wrong these children are becoming even more qualified in dealing with the environment that they're going to find themselves in what needs to be questioned is a schooling environment whose purpose is to train children to enter a working environment that was invented 50 or 100 years ago. That's not going to be there anymore, right? So one of the funniest things I think about is one of my friends told me uh, her daughter had to start homeschooling and there's probably nothing as funny as having a class full of digital native 10 year olds with a school teacher who is 60 and was just hoping to retire soon, who doesn't know how to deal with computers. No, Miss Smith, not that button. No, you just moved it. No, hit that button. This is where you get the chat. Can you imagine what that's like having a group of 20 little kids who know how to deal with something that the teacher doesn't know how to deal with? Yeah. Starts looking like this. I love this one. Right. <laughs> Got this from a friend. 
today one of my students renamed himself reconnecting on the Zoom call, pretending he was having internet issues in order to avoid participating in the class. So what can we do? Here are some suggestions. Petrolieri once said, I find Zoom easier if I don't make eye contact. Then I can mimic this distance presence. If I want intimacy and we're apart, I'll phone. If I want to say that I'm thinking of you, I'll, I'll write. Right? No matter what we do to have a smooth video conferencing experience, video will always lack that mutual enfolding, that mutual reciprocity of the senses that, as Melo Ponty says, that's what comes with the meeting in the flesh. All right. There's actually a lot of research recently that's been done on this, done on questions of Zoom fatigue. One of the most recent studies that just came out a couple of weeks ago from Hall and colleagues says that the richness of a medium does not ensure a social connection despite the increase in social cues. Those people who used video chatting were lonelier and they had greater relationship maintenance difficulties than those who didn't use video chat. Voice calls were associated with less stress and less loneliness, as was email use. Interesting, online gaming and social media were both associated with greater feelings of loneliness. By the way, text messaging had no influence in either direction. Okay. So <clears throat> one thing you might want to think about doing is forgo the additional bandwidth, especially in dyadic, in one-on-one -on -one conversation. Go back to phoning with someone, right? Go back to email, go back to using Slack or some kind of chat some more or less asynchronous means of communication that lessens the amount of cognitive dissonance that you have, right? Obviously, this is more difficult in group work where the lack of visual cues leads to awkward pauses, right? I don't know how many of you have been in phone conferences where about a quarter of the time is just spent because people don't know who is going to speak next and what they're going to say. Another technique from psychotherapy from Mason, you need to learn how to listen. You need to not think you understand too quickly. Be open and listen to people because the more quickly you understand or you think you understand people, the less opportunity there is for dialogue and interaction, and the more opportunity there is for misunderstanding. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get to some real cool psychology stuff. Show you some stuff. If I'm in a meeting with you and you're multitasking, I know that you're not paying attention to me. How do I know that? Come on, I'm a psychologist. I note your reaction time, right? We all miss exposure to what we call people, animals, not in our own home. So when we see a foreign living object in a Zoom call, people who are human and who are paying attention, they'll react in real time. I'll watch and see what your reaction time is. If you have a three second or more delay, I know you're doing something else and you're not paying attention. Your blank stare, just staring at the screen. It's like you're on a first date and your eye contact is too good. It makes you look suspicious. It makes you look creepy. It's, it's effective sometimes too because it looks like you're paying attention, but your eyes are empty, right? Also though, come on, we know you're not listening to us. We know you're probably toggling back and forth to Instagram or Twitter or something like that. Verbal repetition, even though you're looking, I know you're not listening. You do that thing that you did back in high school where 
when the teacher called on you, you didn't know what to say, so you just repeated the last thing that you heard. I can hear it. If your microphone is on, I can hear what's happening in the background. You know, you say you're listening, but either you're typing or your cat's running around on your keyboard. I can hear that stuff. And another one, I can see it. Especially those of you who wear glasses. I can see your screen reflected in your eyes. I can see the screen reflected in your glasses. I can see the colors. I can see the changes in colors. I can see your hand showing, right? I can see the hand moving on your mouth. How do I know that? I can see it reflected in your eyes and I can see it reflected in your glasses. This is some of the cool stuff that we psychologists do. I just wanted to give you some of our tricks. So some simple tips one tip is turn down the brightness on your the screen of your monitor it lessens the reflection it lessens the bad color that comes into your face and gives you a better looking face right set up a team agreement for how you are going to act, react with your team in a virtual setting play with the proximity to your camera try to move your camera further away or closer see how that changes <clears throat> once again make a phone call instead of a video meeting or take a walk outside with virtually with your meeting partners. I have a number of therapist friends who, when they're doing a virtual therapy, since you can't be together and you're missing the nonverbal communication, will say, I'm just going to put on my headphones. I'm going to go out for a walk. You go out for a walk and we'll just talk, get someone out of the office, get them out of their home, get them to move around, get them in the fresh air, if possible, get them out in the woods or someplace in the country. Take advantage of the fact that you don't have to be tied up in the office. Another thing, you know, it's polite to give notice in advance to the others. If you're expecting a visit from somebody from Amazon, or if you have a bad internet connection, or if you're expecting any type of interruption from your cat or your kids or someone during the meeting. One other nice thing to do, you know, give a video tour, show who and what is in your room. A number of my colleagues are very aware about the door to their office being open or closed. I normally close the door to my office so that the people I interact with know that there is no one else in the room except me. Right. <clears throat> so once again, depending on the situation, if possible, leave your microphones on. Listen actively and hide your self view. A good tip, take a post-it, write the word listen on it. And especially if you're using micro Microsoft Teams where you can't turn off the self view, just stick the post-it over the view of yourself, right? All right? Nobody cares what we look like. Now, you know, everybody's used to video conferencing after this year, but it's important to have this stable internet connection, okay? Stay focused. Show your hands. Show your hands when you're talking. Set up a camera angle, camera position that people can actually see your hands. Communicate with them. You can communicate when you catch yourself staring at something. Play with your seating position. Another thing that a lot of colleagues of mine, say, of mine say is never sit directly towards the camera, or if you're live, never sit directly face to face to a person. That's a challenging confrontational position. Sit slightly diagonally. Right? And then start exploring games that you can play online to start building this trust. Okay. So. Some other tips. Those are some relatively simple tips. You've probably heard many of them. Some other stuff. For me, coming back to this talk after a year, taking a look. All right. As we said, trust matters, especially in virtual teams. But most of the emphasis in virtual teams has been on establishing trust. Right? 
current teams already have an established level of trust, be it high or be it low. <clears throat> but then starting to work together virtually, that's challenging them. Rather than focusing on building trust, focus on monitoring and maintaining the trust level that the team has to make sure that it's not being challenged and it's not being weakened because you have less opportunity for observations. Point two, focus on process gains and improvement. Rather than focusing on what you lose in a virtual environment, focus on what you can gain, what the benefits are by changing the channels for sharing information, right? Your team process gains include coordination, cooperation, communication. These are all parts of synergy that effective teams have together, right? How can this synergy be created when everybody's worried about their health, the job security, and life events? <clears throat> the sharing of information is the most challenging part of working virtually. You're missing that coffee machine. You're missing those impromptu conversations that you have with others, right? Okay. You can take advantage of alternative means of communication to help boost the process of that, okay? Another one, foster inclusion. Inclusion is the feeling of being in someone else's space. How can you foster this virtually, right? Everybody's isolated, we're all detached. Right? Those are normal challenges. They've been exacerbated by the current situation. Fostering a psychological safe environment can bridge this gap. Things as simple as having people think about the pros and cons of other ideas, actually verbalizing them, talking about them, that can help people understand others' perspectives. Also, sharing commonalities that people have, right? The fact that everyone is safe, everyone is healthy, that people have problems with their children, with homeschooling, that people have problems with that. Share these commonalities are one way to allow for a sense of being in spite, despite being different and despite being detached. And fourth, retrospect. Assess how your teamwork is doing often. When do you want to know you have a problem? Right? right? A main concern for those who are leading virtual teams is how to monitor people's performance. But quite, come on, honestly, with the fear of salary reduction, or the fear of losing your job, it's likely that most employees are performing already at their maximum capacity. Right? So your task work is important, yes, but what's really going to set an effective virtual team apart is your teamwork ability. Right? Assess that, find out how to deal with that a lot better, okay? So I'm going to give you one last exercise in tr for trust building. <laughs> take a post-it or take a piece of paper and take something to, to write with. And I'd like to think you to think about somebody who you trust or someone who you want to trust, someone you want to feel comfortable interacting with, someone you want to feel inter comfortable working together with. And I'd like to, you to fill in this template. In this context, in this situation, in this environment, right, at work or when we're having a call or things like that, I feel I can most be myself when I can do something or because I can do something if it's already there without you doing something or and you doing something. I'd like to give you two minutes to think about this and write it down, either for a person you already trust or for a person you would like to trust. Okay, take a little bit of time to do this. <clears throat>
Okay. I hope you use this exercise as a way of self-reflection. One thing I would like you to do afterwards, later, sometime soon, is give this to that special person, either live or virtually. Pass it on and start building trust that way. So I'm pretty much at the end of my talk now. As Deming once said, if you don't have data, you're just another person with an opinion. And as a psychologist, I'm very careful about my data. So I actually do have some references that I used for this and some more references and some more references on this and some more references and some more references and some more references and some more references and some more, and guess what? Even more references and some more, okay? I'd like to thank you for listening, okay? If you want, feel free to get in contact with me. One thing about LinkedIn though, I'm happy with hooking up to people on LinkedIn, but I'm not in the business of connecting LinkedIn contacts. If you want to link up with me, I don't know who you are already. Please write me a message and tell me who you are, where we met, and why you're interested in connecting. Okay. LinkedIn recommended you doesn't count. And you really should know me already also doesn't count. But please feel free to interact. I'm going to be around on Slack. I'll be in Gather Town later. But for right now, Let's go on to questions. There's one thing I would like to say about questions. There's a difference between questions and a discussion. <clears throat> I'd like to use this story. The teacher asks the class, does anyone have any questions? And everybody put their hand up. Then the teacher said, remember a question is when you want more information. If you wanna tell me something about yourself, there's time for that later. And then everybody put their hand down. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. Veronica, of... your microphone is off. Uh, yeah. How about should, now? Yeah, your microphone should, is yeah. muted. Uh, yeah, but it should be. I, I should be. I would love to hear what a, you're saying, but we, we have a common microphone, uh, Joseph. So there's only one microphone microphone active. So can you hear Veronica at the moment? Hmm. Yes. Is it like does it work? Can I'm also I'm not hearing anyone's microphone here, so. Let me check myself. Oh, we can hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Can can anyone confirm on Slack that that we are being heard? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah if, they can hear us. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's my, sorry. It's my microphone. Zoom acts very weirdly. It kills my audio sometimes randomly on my uh, <laughs> Mac Mini. My apologies. Yeah. So regarding. Uh, so regarding that, it might be better if you read the questions. Oh God, he doesn't hear me. So we collected a few questions from, from our communication yeah. channels and we would like to display them for everybody so that, so that we have one focus point mm -hmm. uh, coming up, yeah. Regarding noticing when someone is multitasking during a meeting, do you have any tips and tricks how to kindly ask them to focus back on the meeting? <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, I think the first step is just making people aware that you notice it, making that behavior transparent. All right, this, uh, there's an old saying, sunlight is the best disinfectant. One of the techniques, basic techniques, is making a behavior pattern transparent. We know what, what you're doing. We know what game you're playing. Not admonishing them to focus, but just asking them, oh, that's, that's interesting. What are you doing uh, with your other hand? Something like that. Those are the types of techniques. That, um, other than that, I, I'd have to think about it. I don't have many really cool techniques for that. Uh, which statement is closer to you, basically real? 
Trust has to be slowly built and earned or trust has to be granted upfront and can rather be lost. Um, I'm wondering if this is a false dichotomy. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if this is really a Boolean either or. Right? As a process of, de of decreasing uncertainty, trust will be built up. The question is based on someone's disposition, the amount of bad experiences they'll have in the back, in, in their past. They will be predisposed or not to enter into a vulnerable, risky situation of trusting someone. Right? Trust has to be granted up front. What happens if you're dealing with someone who's incapable of doing that? Right, this personality. Uh, I really don't want to go into personality profiling and stuff like that. But there are certain personality traits which tend to inhibit people dispositionally from being open to trusting someone. And also, part of that is their personality. Part of that is based on past experience. What are the best ways to monitor trust? That's a good one. I'd have to. Think about that. I would also, before I answer that, I would want to go back to some of the research and see what others have written about it. Uh, I would be happy to come back to that, but that's not a question that I could answer right now. In some extreme scenarios, trust is the only way to get a problem done. Trust is built because of the situation. But in some extreme environments, we expect trust to be a precondition to attack a problem. This is sort of related to question two, isn't it? Uh, this is related to question two. Trust is built because of the situation. Trust will be built, all right, uh, as a result of doing that. But once again, you need to have this pre this predisposition. Oh God, this uh, right. So it's. This was the right one. So, what what research says here once again is trust is a personal attribute, mm -hmm. right? Which means it has a contextual component. And it has a dispositional component. We talked about the dispositional aspect. Contextual component. Once again, the statement that I like to use is that in this situation, I trust you to do X or I trust you not to do X. It's not just I trust you, but I trust you in this specific situation or context to do something or not do something. And by saying this, you are saying your expectations to someone else. Okay, that's the way I could possibly do. Uh, think about that. Um, there was additional questions in the snack regarding after the presentation was created. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing Slack. I, I'm reading them. Uh, oh, uh, the question above, uh, are we going to get a copy of the presentation? Very interested in the references. Uh, yes, I just want to make sure that the references are all up to date. Uh, I think I missed about a dozen of them, which means it would be yet another page. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, references are mainly in there. They're all in there with I also want to make sure that they're complete in terms of having DOI so that you can go on a place like Sci-Hub and grab them if you don't have access to a university. Um, what are red signals if something is going bad in teams working remotely? Mm. That's a really good question. That's a really good question that I would have to think about that I, 
I can't, and I don't want to give you just, just, just a quick answer. Mm. How do you, um, so what, I'm, I'm happy to take this, this question offline because it's something that interests me, but what you're essentially looking at here is doing a longitudinal analysis over time, which means you're comparing data at various points in time, right? And expecting to see a change among some of these variables over time. That's the way that I would approach this. Now, how would I approach this? What metrics would I use? Um, I have a lot of tools that I use for that. There's actually another talk that isn't online that I'm working on called Beyond Psychological Safety, that if you can catch that, I'm explaining a lot of these tools. There, there are professional tools that we can use as psychologists. There's a bunch of stuff that uh, you can get access to even if you're not a psychologist. So there is there are tools and materials that are available for that. One place, easiest place to start, um, besides looking at the output and the outcomes of the team is going to someplace like uh, one of Amy Anderson's books on psychological safety has a questionnaire at the end with I think 14 questions on it. Start running an analysis on that and seeing how that then changes over time. Mm -hmm. I think there's another uh, tool that's being developed by some young gentleman who just finished their psychology studies in Dusseldorf, that's an online analysis tool that uh, you can also take a look at. And uh, I just lost looking at Slack, but feel free to get in touch with me afterwards. Uh, quite happy to uh, take a look at this with you. Um, so uh, I guess it's almost time. Uh, thank you so much. I really wish I could have done this face to face and interacted with you and then uh, hung out and gone out to dinner and stuff like that. But let's hope that uh, we can do this again next year or sometime. Okay. So I'll be around. I'll be on Slack. I'll see if I can maneuver around gather town or stuff. Feel, please feel free to get in touch if you have any other questions or things like that. And have a nice day. Thanks. <laughs>